Thank you very much for coming to uh, uh, this episode of the NYU Game Center Lecture Series. We're very excited to have Minkat here. Uh, before we begin, I want to thank our sponsors, uh, Fresh Planet, Take Two, and Dots for their generous uh, help in, in, su in supporting the local scene and helping us run this event series. Um, and uh, I want to mention a couple of upcoming events uh, on May 17th. We have the NYU Game Center Student Showcase, the uh, end of the year show. Um, so that's going to be fantastic. I really encourage you guys to come. Uh, don't miss it. It'll be fantastic. It'll be a great show. Um, so please come to that. And then also this summer uh, is our annual game design conference, Practice. And uh, that is running June 21st through the 23rd. And uh, it is a fantastic conference for uh, game designers, uh, a deep dive into the details of uh, design process and, uh, and, and how to make games. It's uh, uh, quite diverse. We always cast a wide net and draw in designers from a lot of different fields. Um, so we'll, we'll have a, an amazing conference and I encourage you to check that out uh, June 21st, 23rd. Um, so very excited to have Minket uh, with us tonight. Uh, Minket is a uh, game designer who specializes in threading the gap between the imaginary and the real. Uh, she has done uh, work that uh, includes uh, alternate reality games, games that blend uh, physical space with, uh, with ideas and, and uh, technology. Uh, she's worked for the, uh, the design company Six to Start, um, which, which does uh, amazing kind of hybrid experimental game design. Uh, she has worked for the uh, Punch Drunk Theater Company, the, the creators of uh, No Sleep Till Brooklyn, and what is it? Sleep No More. Sleep No More, the famous thing, and, um, and a bunch of other really cool things. Um, and she has uh, done uh, a, a, a lot of interesting work in the field of uh, escape room design, which is a fascinating um, emerging field of game design uh, that um, we are going to get an inside peek at uh, tonight. So please join me in welcoming Minkat. Oh, okay. Um, well, there's my desktop. Hi, my name's Mink. Um, uh, let me just sort out this technical issue first. Can someone help? Could you help me? <laughs> um, actually, yeah, if I just pull this out again, sure. then I can put it onto the presentation before the... Okay, thanks. Um, Okay. Hey, excellent. <laughs> uh, what, what would it be without some technical hitches, eh? So, um, hi, so my name is Mink, and um, as Frank said, I'm a game designer of many different kinds of game design, but I am here to talk to you today about Escape the Room games. Um, so these are some of the Escape the Room games that I've designed. Um, the first one I made was Spark of Resistance, which is actually here in Portland, in Oregon, uh, in the US, I mean, the rest are in the UK. Um, so uh, we've kind of made some, some more traditional escape rooms where you get locked in a room and you're there with a team of people. We've also made some kind of slightly more experimental and unusual escape rooms. So, uh, for example, 
framed and the Dyson Smart Rooms were half online with a viewing audience that were participating remotely, um, as well as having people physically in the room. Um, Last Commanders, which is a TV show where uh, small children direct an avatar around a cyberpunk abandoned spaceship. Um, and uh, then Escape Pump, which is the uh, more traditional escape rooms again, uh, but in the UK. So uh, I will be touching on the various types of escape rooms and the kind of trying to like pull a few interesting stories, I hope are interesting stories from uh, my experiences of the more kind of normal escape rooms as well as the kind of more unusual ones as well as we go through. Um, so this was the very first one that we made. Uh, this was about, it was in 2014. Um, we called it Spark of Resistance and uh, the inspiration for wanting to play, to make this game uh, was that this was, if you can think back to a time before when escape rooms were everywhere, uh, there weren't many. There was one in Seattle and there was one in San Francisco. And we lived in Portland, kind of halfway between the two. So we drove up to Seattle and we were kind of underwhelmed by the game that we played. And it's a four hour drive. So on that four hour drive back home, we were like, well, I, I like this, but I'd have done this differently. And oh, that, yeah, that was fun, but I'd have done this. By the time that four hours drive was over, we decided we were gonna open our own escape room in our own hometown. Portland didn't have one, so, and you know, the motto of that town is keep it weird. So we decided <laughs> we would add something weird to our, to our town. Um, so, as I said, the escape rooms, that was way back, way, way back in 2014. Um, four years later, escape rooms are now everywhere. They're incredibly popular, and everyone is always asking, why? Why have they suddenly come out of nowhere, and how has it had such an exponential growth? Um, who here has played an escape room before? See, that's a forest of hands. Who here has not played an escape room? Okay. Um, go on, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. So, so all of you have played zero escape rooms. Does anyone here want to play an escape room who has not played one? Okay, this is good to know, good to know. Otherwise, why are you here? Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, so if you could just keep your hands raised, the people that have uh, not played an escape room. Um, and uh, Bunny, if you'd like to pick some people. Okay. <laughs> Go for it. Um, so, as I was saying, escape rooms have had an exponential growth. Um, in fact, it's one of the things that most people ask. Like, even, even just in the last, uh, since this is January 2012, this is just in the UK, this is data from Exit Games UK, you can see how many more escape rooms have, have been popping up all across the UK um, and various parts uh, around England, around Britain. Um, so there has been uh, such an exponential growth. Almost every town, every small town, is unusual to not have an escape room anymore. Uh, and the question is, why are these things happening? Why do they come everywhere, <laughs> appear everywhere now? Uh, and I think I've got some good answers to this. Um, I've been giving it a lot of thought because people do ask me quite often. Um, <laughs> Uh, that you, you, you do kind of just have the very basic things that you need in order to make them, and that's one of the kind of low barrier to entry points. So, um, what was I saying? Oh, yes. The exponential popularity growth of escape rooms. Uh, it's, they, they're just incredibly uh, popular, and that's because they are relatively low barrier to entry to make. They're kind of easy to make. All you need is a room to escape from, some puzzles, some stuff like physical objects, a timer, and a theme. So there you go, done. Um, all start making escape rooms now. I mean, yes, yeah, a little bit more complicated. Uh, if you really look into it, if you want to make a good escape room, every single one of these things can be pulled apart, dissected, and we can try and figure out exactly where the design criteria are to actually make a really good experience and to figure out why they are so compelling to play. Um, but so let's just go back a step. The, I'm going to go through step by step what things that you need. So uh, as I said, you do need a room, you need puzzles, you need objects, you need players, and ideally some kind of story. So let's start with the room. Um, this is 
the second escape room that I made. So after living in Portland, I had to move back to the UK because my visa ran out. Um, and so I had to leave my beloved escape room behind. And so I just made a new one in the UK. So this is like my two, version 2.0 escape room. Um, there is like one room with lots of bizarre objects in it for people to play in. And it the, we try to make it feel as much as going into a film as possible. It's quite a filmic experience. Um, and the very first thing that people do when they enter into an escape room is that they just search. It's a new world. It's a place where you can explore and a place where you can look for things. Um, I think we've uh, got an example here. Um, if, uh, this is a, like a typical escape room type <laughs> setup. Uh, so as you can see, these people are searching the room. They've, they're exploring this new environment that they're in. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. I see a smile on the prison. A pretty smile. I see a there is in there. So each of these players was given an Easter egg before they went into the room, which had a kind of trailhead clue. Uh, it gave them advice as to what they should be searching for first. Um, and every time that they find something, it, uh, there's, a, there's a chance that when they find that thing, there'll be another clue as to where they can find something else in that room. Um, this is uh, because when you're searching for a room, that's that first time you enter into a space, this is your, your chance to become intimate with it, to understand and to really get where you are, which is where the kind of theming and story really comes in is that you can now feel like you inhabit this new imaginary world. Um, so... <laughs> I think you can see them properly inhabiting that world right now. If you think about when you're in a com computer game, like, pixel hunting is really annoying, really frustrating. Like, but it, searching is one thing. Making sure that you actually find everything is far more useful. So uh, these guys have a couple of different ways of finding out when they've actually completed that puzzle. Uh, so... Um, oh, I just kind of want to watch now. Um, hey! Okay. <laughs> Uh, so, as you might be able to see, they, as they find things, they are finding, um, just on the, the left there, they are assembling a jigsaw puzzle. So, the jigsaw puzzle has a finite shape, and so once they have all of those pieces, and once they all fit together, they know that that puzzle is complete. They have all those bits. <laughs> Um, so just to go back to talking about escape rooms again for a moment, um, we'll just uh, leave them for a second, uh, because I want to tell you another story, another anecdote about one of my weirder escape rooms. Um, so this was the Dyson Smart Room. Dyson is a vacuum cleaner brand in the UK, but they want to be not known as a vacuum cleaner brand from the UK. Um, so what they're going to do is now move into the realm of the Internet of Things and connected homes, like... Uh, Siri talking to your vacuum cleaner. Sorry, I really can't get the vacuum cleaner thing out <laughs> the way. Um, so they wanted to have an escape room to, to they wanted to find uh, software engineers. So people that had that kind of thinking and a good recruitment process they thought would be to make them play an escape room live on Twitch with a viewing audience as a competition and the prize was that you would win a job interview and a very expensive vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Um, so we built this room. They actually, uh, we, they gave me this picture first and I was like, I love that picture. I want to go in that room. Um, so what I did was, uh, I also didn't have enough space. I just had one small room. And one thing that people really like about escape rooms is finding secret rooms, finding that secret hidden panel, that secret door to a whole new space. Um, but I only had one room and there wasn't really anywhere I could hide anything. Um, also, this was meant to be a connected home. So like there's the living room, the kitchen, like the, all the, the bathroom, all these different places in the house that you want to be able to explore. Um, so what we did is we made a black box room and we drew different rooms around that same black box. 
And depending on which electroluminescent wire we switched on, they were in a different room. Um, so cupboards that you opened, only opened, were relevant to certain things. So uh, when the yellow room is lit up, then you can open, I think the yellow room is the fridge, was that? Yeah, so when you're in the kitchen, um, then the, the weird little box in the corner, you open it and it's a fridge and you can play with the puzzles that are fridge-related puzzles. Um, then that same object, when it's under the red light, that's now in the bedroom and it becomes a cabinet and so a different puzzle a uh, different door opens on it. So um, it's, it was a way of kind of trying to reimagine the space and also to make better use of the space. Um, it was also a bit of a four-dimensional jigsaw puzzle of time and space, trying to layer up, well, we need to make sure that this thing doesn't open at this time because that's not in the garage, even though it's physically in the same space. Um, so, yeah, that was quite a f an exciting game to, to have to figure out how to to create as well as being pretty good to play. Uh, yeah, it had quite a, an intricate puzzle flow. Um, so that brings me to puzzles. And uh, one of the, the ways that I like to think of, oh, who's seen the crystal maze? Does anyone know? Oh, excellent. It's such a weird cult classic. Everyone, everyone in Britain has seen it. Like we were forced to watch it as a child. It was <laughs> mandatory. Um, if you're, I don't know if you've seen the film Rocky Horror Picture Show, but that's Richard O'Brien there on the, on the left. Uh, he was the host of... So you had this strange mix of, like, every small child knew who Richard O'Brien from the Rocky Horror Picture Show was. That's why British people are like that. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, here's, here's a corner store, cornerstone of my childhood. Uh, and this was a, a, a TV show where people got locked into a room for three minutes at a time, had to solve a puzzle whilst their friends helplessly shouted not very useful uh, things like, get the crystal! And we're like, of course I'm going to get the crystal! Um, anyway, sorry. If you can watch it, it's on YouTube, watch it. Uh, so there were four kinds of puzzles in this TV show. There were mental puzzles, mystery puzzles, skill puzzles, and physical puzzles. And I kind of like to think that that's a nice way of thinking of breaking down the different kinds of puzzles you can put into an escape room. Um, so uh, if you think about what the, we've seen in that room briefly, which we should go back to in a moment, um, there are the kind of puzzles that you can think of as like the classic puzzly puzzles. Mental uh, puzzles such as uh, math puzzles, mazes, logic, cipher. And this is an example here is called a pig pen cipher. So this pig pen code is a very easy way of memorizing a cipher, a, a secret code, because um, if you ever see like an L shape, then that means C. If you see an L shape with an L, a dot in it, then it means L. Um, it's, a, it's a really easy way of like creating a cipher that anybody can, can learn and figure out what the secret message is. Um, so uh, we also have physical puzzles, and that's kind of a unique thing to escape rooms, is that you have got the ability to actually physically move things around. Uh, we may have played games like Lara Croft, where you are basically doing big block moving puzzles, but it's not the same as actually having to try and cerebrally solve a puzzle by moving an actual piece of concrete yourself. Um, so there's spatial puzzles, and then there's all the other things that, like the, that we in a computer game would use a physics engine to replicate. Um, uh, oh, I've just realised something. Um, hi, and if anyone can, if any rabbits can hear me, can you come back to the auditorium, please? Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so physical puzzles like mass, weight, volume, those things are really tactile and really like pleasant and pleasurable to actually to use, uh, and and you can play with those things in the real world. Um, and uh, skill, dexterity, agility puzzles, things where, like balancing and, excellent, things like balancing, uh, trying to try something over and over, like those puzzles, like fairground puzzles, essentially, like how many times can you throw a ball? Um, 
And then the mystery ones, which is maybe also what we think more about with escape rooms, is the kind of trying to solve a murder mystery or trying to uh, escape from like horror, uh, like how how the how a story and like creepy creepy things can kind of like mix in. Um, okay, we're good. So uh, let's 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 go back to our escape room. So let's see. We've got um, we've got our our players here, but I think they've not actually been able to solve that puzzle yet. Um, thankfully, they've got some new players that have come to help them. Hooray! <laughs> uh, so. Right, that's me now, then. Are there cipher clues? Because we now know that. Oh. Okay. Well, I'll also have a good group of people who are missing. Yeah. So can you explain to me how we got those? Um, we fell in here. In here, there's like, what, there's, there's four. Can I say <laughs> Okay, so what we have here is a physical puzzle mixed with a cerebral puzzle. Um, you can't quite see it, unfortunately. Um, they, so they have assembled a jigsaw puzzle, and that so, jigsaw puzzle... Uh, so the two people that just entered into the room gave them the last two pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, which allowed them to get a sequence um, of strange directions. So um, I think they have found... Yeah, they definitely have found. So on that table, I thought I had a photograph, but I don't have it. Uh, on that table in the middle of the room, there are two rabbit holes. Um, one of them is surrounded by orange flowers, and one of them is surrounded by purple flowers. And this is what you can, see, what they've seen on their jigsaw puzzle clue. Um, this is very much a teamwork thing. There's no physical way that you can solve this by yourself. So we've got uh, two players, one on either side of the table, have to stick their arm right inside the rabbit hole until they can feel the rabbit's fuzzy tail. Um, and in each one, there are a series of letters, which are physical, physically there. So they can, they can feel the letter shape, but they can't see it. So by feel alone, they've now got to decipher a sequence of letters. One person has got vowels, one person has got consonants. We've got one person at the back is writing down everything that they're telling them, that the two people on each side of the table are reading out. Another person is reading the jigsaw puzzle to tell them kind of almost like a map of directions of where they should be groping around in that hole right now. Um, and so hopefully we now have... Yeah, okay. So they've gotten all four codes, for all four words, and now hopefully are going to unlock a padlock. Uh -huh. Here we go. Hooray! <laughs> so I was saying before about how a lot of escape rooms have secret rooms, oh, yeah. and there's not really ever much space. If, if, as you can see, this room has only got one room, and I couldn't like build an extra wall or anything. Um, so there wasn't really any space to build a secret extra room in here, um, unless, unless there's, I don't know, maybe if they, yeah! Uh, there is a secret extra room hidden under the table. Um, <laughs> so they're now entering. Um, and um, I don't know, this might, might work, this might not work, but uh, Jimmy the bunny, are you able to take the other webcam under the table? Oh, I see, they're pulling up. Um, and then you'd have to also shift between cameras. <laughs> but I think, I think possibly it's going to be a little bit ambitious to get that to work. Um, so now our team is split even more. Hey, Carol. Oh, I found the. Uh... Carol, it's this house. You should be careful. Oh, it's my rabbit hole. This 
Maybe he has friends over. Um, we just made it really look like you weren't supposed to go under there. Um, yeah, so the, uh, the question was, did we do anything to stop people going under the table earlier? Um, so we cable tied all around the edges so that if you tried to lift the fabric, you wouldn't be able to. Um, and under there, there's also a cardboard kind of den. Um, and on the walls of that cardboard den, there are some secret messages. Also inside that present they just got, as well as the beautiful box that he's playing with, there was an, a UV a black light. Uh, a black light. So if they shine the black light under there, then they will be able to find the secret messages written on the walls. Um, <laughs> Uh, so whilst people are, uh, are exploring there, let's go back to some more anecdotes. Um, so uh, this, there's as well as uh, trying to think of puzzly puzzles, the kind of things that we know and expect to understand to be puzzles, there's also a lot of scope for actually trying to just find things that are satisfying, things that you do in the real world that that yeah, no one designed it, but you had to solve it. Um, like for example, if you're like trying to find that cable that where's it plug into, and you have to follow it all the way around the room. Um, so there was one puzzle in there that was essentially just following a puzzle, following a cable around the room. Um, then there's other ways of of kind of taking interactions. Uh, this uh, the the second escape room that I made was was there and, and the first one, but it's very strongly based on the feeling of watching the film Brazil, which is if you've not seen Brazil, it's the Monty Python version of 1984, which I know, yeah. Uh, so it's incredibly strange and incredibly dark. Um, and we wanted to give that feeling that you're going into this world and that the, the, like the bureaucracy and the, the kind of um, the society itself is something you want to escape from. Um, it was not a pleasant world to go into. It was a big office and you're uh, not welcome there. You're, you're, you're greeted at first by a propaganda training um, and you're, you're going into the Ministry of Information, you've got to like sneak in and find out what's happened to the resistance's double agent who's vanished from in there. Um, oh, wrong button. Uh, so the, the very first thing that, uh, that you had to do when you went into this escape room was confront the secretary. So this is not actually a puzzle puzzle in any way. Um, you have got, the, the team have gone in and they have got some, some money and some coupon, food coupons and then the actual escape room itself is still between them. There is the secretary and the door, and she won't let them in because uh, it's just not her job's worth. She's not had lunch for 11 hours. She's starving. She's got a food headache, and she's so stressed out. She does not want to talk to you. Get out of her sight. This was a puzzle of social engineering. This was trying to figure out what a person wants in order to, to blackmail them or to just persuade them to do what you want to turn a blind eye to the fact that they weren't supposed to be there. Um, so you had to, by talking to her, in the same way that you might talk to an NPC in a puzzle game, but this is a real person, so that's a bit scarier. Um, they, uh, you find out that she wants, she's hungry, so you try and bribe her to just go away for an hour whilst you go into the escape room and rifle through her boss's desk. Um, the other thing that this teaches you is that this world is corrupt. The fact that she, she lets you in, she lets you bribe her, and you're already complicit in this unpleasant society. You are part of this system that is broken and wrong and corrupt. Um, oh, damn it. Uh, this was very much part of, uh, inspired by it, playing Papers, Please. So I wanted to give that feeling, like as the player was, was playing, it was like by playing the game as it, itself, I have made a choice to be complicit in a world that I don't like and I disagree with and to ask questions of themselves like am I that kind of person do I bribe someone is is that who I am um and so that was something that we we wanted to bring into the game by taking from outside sources not just puzzly puzzles um uh the other the other thing of like yeah sorting out cables or um sifting jelly beans I've I've fallen prey to the YouTube algorithm of, of looking at all those satisfying things, videos, um, hours I've wasted now, um, but not wasted, invested in finding out <laughs> what is the most satisfying way to like 
distract someone. Like, you don't have to put a puzzle in a room. People are there to have physical fun. They can uh, physically enjoy alphabetizing fruit. Um, <laughs> Which, uh, so let's, let's see whilst, let's see if anyone is alphabetizing fruit in this room. Aha! They have found the other puzzle. So, um, the, two, the two puzzles that are underneath, one of which is an embroidery puzzle. Um, so, they have got one person is still under the table. Uh, and they have a ribbon. And there are lots of holes. Oh, so when they climbed under the table, there was a, a cord that you could pull, which pulled up the other side of the, okay, of so the fabric. Uh, um, I, they I, have I got to uh, answer questions. So the questions are written on either side of the piece of paper. Um, and they push the ribbon through the holes that match the correct answers. So it's kind of like a... It's not even trivia. It's very simple questions like uh, which a, is in the top right. a a a to b uh, one to two cookies and milk like which things go together matching pairs as they match those pairs they will make a ribbon embroider like a cross stitch embroidery through the wall and that will make a pattern which is the pig pen code that we saw earlier on the screen. What is this? What is our A? Luckily, because we had the pig pen code on the screen earlier, we know that two people in that room already have memorized the pig pen code and know how it works. So uh, we've, uh, as soon as they have finished embroidering that piece of paper, they'll be able to get that code and figure out uh, what the final answer is. Um, one of the other things about an escape room is that uh, one of the best things is being in the control room and watching people play um, and like when you know the answers as well it can get quite frustrating it's like shouting at the television she's like just go left and like they don't know to go left but you just shout and um uh, it's almost like uh, I, I, I kind of wanted to add this for, for my wow. game control the people running my games masters who were running the game it was if I was watching them play it was kind of like watching them play the sims like they had their characters the players were their characters and they were like yeah come on guy with the blue hat um, come on I love you. oh you're my favourite and they'd be they'd be like yeah. Like trying to like shout at them and trying to get them to do stuff. So I'm um, like watching the players play the puzzles and then watching games masters play the Sims um, with real people. And like the way that you interact is to give clues. So like the the games masters will sometimes give a lot of clues. If you're ever in an escape room and the person is giving you lots of clues, you get really frustrated. And you're like, I'm not stupid. Just let me solve stuff. Like they don't want you to solve stuff yourself. They want you to do what they want. <laughs> you're their sim characters. Go where I tell you. Um, so yeah. Uh, so we've now got we've so we've got two people who are sat on the side. Um, let's call them Teddy Bear and Chick. Uh, oh wait, they are actually they are writing something down. Oh cool. So there are two puzzles in there. So underneath as well, um, when they put the black light over it, because it would be far too easy to give them the pig pen code that they've just learned and just have them do that straight so what I did was that I said I took all the pigs out the pig pen and I put different animals in so instead of the alphabet being in the code there's different animals so they'll have to figure out uh, yeah we've got some letters here um, so I think they've already done the, the it with the alphabet pig pen code I hope they're doing it with the other one I think they are because they yeah they're getting they're pretty close um, so instead of there being A, B, C, D, E, F, G in a uh, hexagon, uh, not hexagon, hashtag shape, uh, there would be a picture of a horse and a lion. So instead of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, it's H, O, R, S, E, uh, L, E, I, O, N. So um, I did have photos for this, but I haven't been able to put them on the slide. Sorry. Um, so. Uh, so now they are trying to figure out what the rabbit's name is. And that's the final thing that they need to be able to get into the case. So the pig pen code that they've now embroidered onto that wall 
they have actually got here the answer. Um, they are two letters away. So exciting. Um, of course, if they don't manage to escape, they are now trapped in my presentation forever. Um, then what is the backwards L with the backwards L And you're all trapped in this room forever watching this presentation. Um, sorry, I really should have made that clearer at the beginning. This is a cursed lecture. Uh, <laughs> I kind of don't know if I want to... Oh, are they trying the lock? Is he tr he's brute forcing the lock. That's so sneaky. Hey! Okay, let's find out what have they found. We got it! Treasure! Yay! <laughs> so they all get medals and then there's lots of candy so hopefully you, well there's maybe not enough for everyone you all get half a candy each yay those are all the way from top oh and buddy you're also a winner so they have broken the curse and we are now free <laughs> Um, I don't know how long did that take. Oh wow! Okay, it is it is five minutes to eight. So we actually kind of did it to time, which is amazing. <laughs> um, so uh, if, if if our rabbits would like to return to the auditorium um, and bring their candy with them. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so I did actually have a few more slides left, but let's, uh, let's leave it at that. <laughs> a round of applause to our escapees. Um, so, yeah, so we, uh, now that we have escaped from the room, so this was kind of like a race to see how far I could get through my presentation um, versus how fast the people could escape from the escape room. So um, they, they definitely won. Um, <laughs> Uh, so we did have time, I think we've got time, oh, I can do my conclusion. So the conclusion was, um, escape rooms, the reason why I think they're, they're so popular, in fact, I could just skip, oh, I don't know if I can skip to the end without triggering more rabbits, no! <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, now we're just going to look at all the things, right. <laughs> um, So uh, if we, um, yeah, that rabbit was going to just keep coming back. Um, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to speed through like these new thoughts. So uh, one of the nice things about being in an escape room, as I was saying, is physical objects. Um, and this is a new thought. This is something that, that only came up with me yesterday. So I'm just kind of putting, uh, putting this. I've, I've been talking to my sister. My sister's a yoga teacher. Um, and we were like, what, what would a yoga escape room be like? Escape from the yoga. Um, but because it's, like, it's almost like the exact opposite, right? Because one is about being calm and about centering yourself, and then the other is about just being frantic and running around. But so what actually is that, like, one of the things that is very noticeable is like when you're there, you're like in the zone, you're in that physical space. Being in an escape room and actually interacting with those puzzles, really focusing on them and being physically present is actually quite similar. You're thinking a lot about your body, about your presence. You're way more in tune with what you're doing and your movements and your actions. So we were kind of thinking, like, from the point of view of can you make a yoga escape room, um, then it made me think, like, yeah, maybe that's the one thing, maybe that's the thing that makes escape rooms unique from any other kind of game or puzzle is that you are in tune with, like, your your own body and your physical presence um, which then kind of uh, to like skip through a bit more uh, like the teamwork that we saw uh, there's that bunny again the idea that escape rooms are places that you need to escape from is perhaps the wrong way round we've got Places uh, we can we've got escapism already. We escape we escape into films and to me and we we expect everything now to be far more um, extra real when you see it on 
on silver screen. Like you expect there to be dragons and uh, you don't expect that to be in the real world. So kind of going into an escape room is almost like, can I enter into a physical world um, and just embody that imagine like if you are imagining it so hard that it becomes real to really kind of lose yourself in that space and to to be able to have an imaginary world created for you that you can put yourself into properly physically be there and feel like you belong and that is something that's really special so maybe they're not rooms that we escape from but they're rooms that we escape in so escapism rooms um, that is my talk. Thank you for playing. <laughs> so I think we have some time for Q and A. Um, and uh, why don't you come here and sit? And uh, we will uh, we'll, we'll open it up to um, to some some questions and answers and. Uh, Already, already questions, wow. There we go, yes. Thank you. Please. You mentioned that uh, you started your first escape the room after being inspired um, on your car ride home. Uh, what location did you secure for that room? Where was the first room? Um, so the question was, where was our first room? It was uh, in, in Portland. It was near the train tracks. I can't remember exactly where it was, but it was like a, an old, it used to be a, like a tea warehouse. So it was like a, a, a sort of storage area. Um, I'm not entirely sure. And as I said, this was four years ago. So uh, real estate is, is always the hardest bit to, to actually get the physical space is one of the hardest things. Um, I know a lot of us, if you're thinking of like, where can I open mine up? Um, one of the solutions that people have come up with in, uh, the, in, in like London is as, as hard to get spaces as it is as New York. Um, that they have made deals with pubs, um, bars. And so like if they've got like a function room or they've got like an upstairs bit that they aren't using, then uh, just like pop up an escape room or have the, the top floor plus the bar has already got like a liquor license and has got like insurance for different things. So um, yeah, it's if, if you can partner with somebody, that's a really good way to, to be able to get space or just try and find cheap out of town spaces somewhere. Um, I have a quick question. Uh, how So um, it seems like one of the biggest challenges with puzzle design is uh, play testing, right? N uh, puzzles can be very difficult to predict how, how, uh, how challenging they're going to be. Um, and when you're linking a bunch of puzzles together, it, it can be very uh, tricky uh, to know whether one or more might become a brick wall or, or something that stops people. Um, how do you, do you do a lot of iterative play testing or do you just like um, make your best guess and, and give people clues to, to get them through? Um, yeah, definitely play testing is, is definitely the best way to go. Uh, I, um, we, we play tested about half of these puzzles because obviously we built it yesterday and today so we didn't get a chance to play test all of them. Seems like it worked out pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I hope so. Did the people that play it, did it feel like it worked? I don't know. It was like, give me feedback. No, um, <laughs> not, not, not this way. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> somebody lives there now. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so we did, we play tested some things. Uh, I've, uh, it, yeah, I think it is essential. And it's something also, all of the puzzles that were in there were made of paper or like padlocks, very, very low tech. Um, if you want to play test things with like electronics in them, um, you can paper prototype that, like make, uh, so um, some of the ones we had, we had, a, I think it was nine different computers in the escape room, in the uh, uh, escape new Pelagia one. Um, when we play tested that first, one of those, one of the most elaborate ones in the first play test was a shoebox. Um, and somebody stood next to the shoebox that said, yes, that's open now. Um, it, it, you don't have to do all the complicated stuff. As long as you've got an idea of what it's meant to do, it's like, oh, so we need to flick all these switches. It's uh, like ones and zeros because it's a binary choice of each switch. We knew it was going to be covered in switches, yeah. but uh, those switches we could just make out of cardboard and somebody could be there pretending to be the computer program. Um, so having like a really good guess of what it is 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 a good start. Um, 
I do want to tell an anecdote, actually. Oh, um, so uh, one thing that is that playtesting brings out is that you do not... There's stuff that you just didn't think of. So uh, we had a, a kind of baptism of fire playtest. One of the first playtests is that we got a bunch of game designers to come and test the first room. That's a terrible, terrible idea. Um, in, and in the room... So uh, Doug Wilson and Bennett Foddy were in the team that were oh, testing. That's a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'd had a previous group had gone through and they, there was like some, a pad of paper and they had written on the pad of paper and like their pencil marks had gone through and like obviously we'd torn off that paper but we'd left the other ones and so and of course some people are going to like go over it with pencil and see what the previous uh. teams have written that's what normal annoying humans would have done however game design are annoying humans um, so Bennett saw that there was like this writing on the pad and went oh Things that were written previously, we can find out everything that was written previously on that typewriter. If we disassemble it and take the ink ribbon out, we can see everything that has been previously typed on the typewriter. And to be fair, if I had not left that pad of paper in there, it wouldn't have seemed as natural a choice to disassemble something and cover yourself in ink. Um, but they did that, and then I had to respool it because that was not the solution. <laughs> are there? Uh, so, the, as I understand it, there are different cultures of escape room in uh, geographically in different locations. Um, I, I, I am told that in Los Angeles, there's a lot of kind of immersive theater, and um, I know that in London, there's some famous escape rooms. Um, in I, I'm. As I understand, in Eastern Europe, there are a lot of like really elaborate escape rooms that are um, can be uh, sometimes quite dangerous because there's there's less uh, regulation, uh, there's less safety regulations. Mm -hmm. I've heard there's amazing ones there. Are there any that are kind of famous as a designer? Have you encountered any that were really spectacular, that were influential? Um, are there any f yeah you know, ones that are super well known among the people who make them? Um, well, it's a bit of a tricky thing in that. Uh, if anyone has played an escape room, it's almost like there's a code of don't tell anyone what was in it. Yeah. So people go, like, oh, this one's amazing. It's so good. I can't tell you anything about it. And so like, there's, th there's names I've heard of, but I don't actually know why they're good or if they're good. Um, uh, I'm quite. I'm going to go and play the. There's one called Sherlock in Amsterdam, which is supposed to be good. I don't know why, but I'm going to go play that one soon. I'm very excited. But that's kind of like all of it. Unless you've played it, like you can't know for sure. So there's probably lots around the world. There was um, there was a, a sort of meme type thing about a Russian on Facebook about a, someone who had dis, had written a description, and it was almost like creepy pasta. Um, the description of this Russian escape room where they're like climbing through vents and there's zombies children and there was no way of like finding out like yeah they, it, and it, one of the people didn't know that they were in this uh, this this uh, horror event and was just terrified the whole way through it's there's some incredibly detailed descriptions I don't know if that is actually a real escape room or if it is just some creepypasta that's on Facebook but it could be and that's part of it is like well and also I could now try and do that like I maybe wouldn't have the hundred foot drop that you have to jump over um, but like yeah and it was like oh turns out it was an abandoned factory that they were just crawling around in and they put some actors in the zombies it's like that's really dangerous um, but I think yeah I'm, I'm afraid I, I can't really give give you any good sure. tips um, <laughs> is, is it possible to talk a little bit about the economics of it because it seems like uh, I mean people pay what like 50 bucks or something um, to do an escape room. And if you go to one of these, it doesn't seem like the throughput is enormous. Like they're not moving that many people through. Um, and you consider like how much it costs to rent a space and to staff a thing and to design it and maintain it. Uh, it doesn't seem super lucrative. Uh, and yet there's so many of them and they're cropping up all over the place. Uh, do you have any insights into you know into the the economics of this and whether they're self sustainable? Um, well, the, uh, like the from an uh, like throughput, yeah, is is quite low. But if you can compare it to like going to the theatre, then like I suppose there's like hundreds of people all watching the same thing. So that's a bad example. Yeah. Um, wait a second. Uh, <laughs> 
uh, it, it is lucrative in that you 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 buy all of your fixed assets up front. So yeah. all of your puzzles, all of that stuff, you just build it. And there is wear and tear, but you've built that that set once, and people go through it, and are, then you're kind of just paying for like your basic overheads, and uh, there's nothing not much consumed. Mm. So um, the more people you can run through. Uh, then it, yeah, it quick and and yeah, the ticket prices are high, and that's why because it like if you're if you're locking out this space for for an hour for each group, you need to make sure that you're getting enough money. Um, but they yeah, it's it's uh, I think there's there's potential for it. Um, if you think of it as like an entertainment form, like theatre or music, it is the same kind of uh, uh, kind of quite slim margin in comparison to like owning a bar where every drink is like massive profit but um, um, are there any other questions from the audience yes Yeah, that's um, that's definitely a very fun part of of designing an escape room. Is um, a, it's also the, the the kind of the nice part of of, uh, of playing it as well as when you um, not feel like you've been tricked, but like when you when you've re realised that you've witnessed a good illusion, like you had to have been playing along in a certain direction in order to to be. Uh, taken in another direction and it feels like a big reveal it's rewarding it's exciting um, so there's yeah there's like all of the kind of things that you, you that you listed like playing with uh, setting up player expectations into one direction um, those are good ways to kind of do do kind of simple illusions so if you design those things in you can give people a bit more kind of drama um, yeah um, yes So, yeah, how do you design for timing to get a room to work out in an hour, I guess, is the traditional, right, yeah. experience length for, so how do you figure out timing issues? Um, there is, uh, there, uh, that's another place where playtesting can come in, um, definitely, but uh, if you're, so this is something I'm trying to do now, uh, more so, like, as, as you get more experienced is uh, in, in the same way that when you, like, Debug a computer game. I'm assuming you're all game designers. Are you all game designers? Does anyone, everyone here know what? Hooray! Okay. So you know when you like have a computer game and you put debug, <laughs> debug on that debug menu. So I, I'm not a programmer. So this is something somebody normally yeah, that's makes. That's what you do. You put, you put debugs into a, a computer game. That's how it works. No. Uh, all right. So, um, so my, uh, so when I. When I've worked with a programmer and we made a computer game, he gave me a debug menu, and the debug menu let me. Uh, tweak any parameters that I needed to. So um, as long as you put things in as kind of variables that you can adjust. So for like timing and difficulty, if you've got a particular kind of puzzle, um, then if you can figure out where, what is my slider for making this particular puzzle longer or shorter to, to solve? And then um, when you're playtesting it or when you're like still designing it, you can tweak it based on like responses, like based on how many players are, uh, how many players get through it in a certain time. Like if, if you're seeing uh, as people play, there is a definite obvious bottleneck, then you know you need to go fix it. If you have thought ahead and made each of those variables, then you can easily tweak it. Um, what is the dream is to have games that very change that variable on the fly in response to the players themselves um, which is something which I I'm not going to say that's what we do it's like that's what that's what an escape room designer would want to have I have no idea who's managed to pull it off or not because that's also going to be like behind the scenes a lot as well um, player groups are going to have to, like 
uh, I think my, my main way of dealing with it was to just put lots of different kinds of puzzle in. Because if you've got one group that's just like running through everything, like really, really nailing a particular kind of puzzle, then they're going to hit another type that's completely different way of thinking that will slow them down. So you can kind of average out the teams by changing up, making sure that you've got a good mix of different puzzle ways of thinking, ways of solving stuff. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm curious to hear more about your experience working with Punch Rock and what parallels you find between immersive theater and escape rooms. Um, so the question was uh, about Punch Drunk and the similarities between immersive theatre and escape rooms. So the escape rooms that I've designed, I've kind of always sort of come at it from a theatrical, immersive theatre point of view. That's the experience I want to have and that's the experience I want to give people. Um, and that, uh, that kind of feeling of being lost in a space and like really just enjoying the environment um, I kind of, I, I don't want to say environmental st storytelling um, because that's a little too on the nose, but uh, in the, you can um, imply a lot and, and with the, the like leading players' expectations, as, as I said, you can pull people in a certain direction by how you design that space, like putting theatrical lighting in a certain place, they're going to go walk over there, having a dramatic thing. If, if uh, I try to make it so that if something really big and dramatic and we want everyone's attention to all be back together, um, so they're all like split up to do different puzzles. When they've completed all of those puzzles, like they need to just push some kind of big red button and a huge dramatic thing happens right in front of them. And so kind of like leading people to a specific place. Um, we talk about like staging and blocking, like where... Where is, where is this hero moment? This one person is going to solve this thing. Are they well lit? Are they in a piece of scenery? Where is everybody else in the room? Can they see them? Um, and so kind of stage, so it's not even, like even just by place, where you place the puzzles in the room, you can, you can do a bit of environmental storytelling to make sure that hero moment happens and they're looking great. Um, <laughs> Uh, again, that is another nice to have thing. That is something a desire that you want to have in your escape rooms rather than the, the, the standard. Um, yeah. So, uh, just kind of piggybacking on that, um, you talked about the way that you talk about, like, you're reluctant to say environmental storytelling. So, uh, I've followed uh, the, the talks of Laura Hall, who was one of the designers of the Parker Resistance, and she's mm -hmm. very much about story of the space and when you're not before and how you talk to the environment. It seems that you sound like more reluctant to talk about story directly. Can you elaborate a bit more on what your philosophy in relation with the story of the room is? Um, yeah, and, and uh, as you said, Laura Hall definitely talks about uh, that kind of storytelling. And the, when I say I don't want to say, but it's, it's more like it's a whole can of worms I don't want to open. Um, but like, yeah, the... the uh, so yeah, Laura and I worked together on the first escape room that we made, and um, we were also like really big into the kind of going to the, going to punch drunk shows and, and things like that together. So uh, the um, it's definitely something that I think is desirable and is a useful tool um, if you are wanting to like hint something or make something more obvious, like as a puzzle as to where you should what trying to guide the players to do the correct thing rather than waste time by like getting fascinated by what turns out to just be somebody else had knocked over a, a post-it or something um they uh if you want to guide people to the right place you can you can do so by telling that story um so one thing that, that laura uh i assume she coined this term i really think she did um of of, of calling it like diegetic narrative so not just so in the same way that like a in a film you've got the diegetic sound so the sounds that are coming from the space um when the music is playing it's coming from the radio and it has not been layered on top um so we kind of wanted to bring in like diegetic narrative is not story that has been laid on top it's not additional it just kind of bleeds out through the environment that you're in like you embody the story that is wanted to wanting to be told by the world because the world is guiding you to do the actions that you're choosing to do but it's the direction that you that the story wanted you to go in um so yeah the 
the di di diegetically leading you to, to tell the story that the designer wanted you to tell. Are there any stories or themes that you've wanted to do that you haven't had a chance to do? Is there anything that, yeah. tell us, can you tell us a little <laughs> bit about that? We certainly don't have time. <laughs> there's like so many. Um, I, there's, uh, I, I, my, my new thing that I really want to do next is uh, genre mashing. So there's lots of different genres and escape room stories do tend to be quite genre led and quite obviously like there's the uh, breaking into a bank vault, finding out a murder, there's a ghost. Um, there's <laughs> <laughs> zombies and uh, and breaking out of prisons so I want to kind of like take take those like at least two of those and like halfway through just twist it so that you so you go so the one thing that I've been like my, my one that's in my head that I want to play with is you go into a uh, it's a prison break you're in like 1950s Ameri small town American uh, police station cell um, you get locked into the cells and you're all split up which is like a classic escape room opener like you're all split up into cells and then you have to get out of the cells and work together um, as you're in there there was a police guard the police guard that brought you in or there's like a police dog that you, you can hear um, and as you get halfway through like the lights start sh shuddering and going dark and stuff and then you hear the dog die and <laughs> Um, you hear weird shit happening. And as, so as you're escaping, um, we are like, what are we escaping into? So you break out of the prison cells and that small town America in the 50s was Roswell and they were keeping aliens in, in the cell. And now the, F, uh, the CIA, I don't know who would be appropriate, the CIA are going to come and set fire to bla burn the whole thing down. Um, and so it's like a bit like the thing. So the dogs turn into a monster and you've got to like walk past the alien things that are trying to grab you and you've got to get out. Um, so that's what I would like. So that's a genre mess, a genre mashup. Like you expected to go into a prison breakout and end up in an alien abduction. Wow. So other things like that. That's very cool. <laughs> um, any other uh, questions? Yeah. Um, well, I think that there were people that did make them back in the early noughties. Um, there were, uh, I think, like the first ones in Japan or somewhere in Asia, the first one was like 2005, I think they said. Like, if you average out all of the when the first escape room is claims, you get to about 2010. Um, and I certainly played like immersive theater type games where I was locked in a room and had to work with other people to solve a mystery to get out. So I, I, I had played things in like 2010 that were probably escape rooms, but they just weren't called that. Um, I, I mean, I've, I've got my theories. My theory is, as I was saying about the kind of, um, our expectations of like how, of how, kind of cool and imaginary world should be the the game of thrones of things like watching watching dragons fly from the sky we expect that now we expect incredibly detailed and immersive worlds um and i think that the thing that has changed that means that escape rooms can become more uh real now is to, to meet that that barrier of of uh of how impressive you can be is is things like arduinos and um, I don't know, even like Unity. I don't know, like what, all the things that have happened since 2005. Um, but to be able, like those, yeah, Arduino and Raspberry Pi, they, these have come into more common people's hands. The ability to do electronics and to make cool shit happen with, uh, is, is now so much easier and lower barrier to entry. I suspect that because most escape rooms, a lot, a lot of escape rooms are kind of mom and pop operations. It's people making their own and wanting to make uh, the best thing that they can. And because the best thing that those people can make now is actually something with, with kind of almost like special effects 
uh, that would have been impressive in a film in 2000 and something. Um, I think that that's probably it, is that technology has finally come into commonplace use that can meet our level of disbelief suspension that we have. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Yeah. So a question about the technology and the emerging tech and touch screens and things like that. Um, so I think it, if, as long as you f can find a useful and logical way for that to fit into your the world that you've built, then I think that you can use anything, anything and everything in order to, to enrich your game. It's only when it's something, it becomes... Uh, uh, an analog for something else. So in, if you're using a touch screen when really you should be using big chunky push buttons, if all that touch screen is doing is just kind of aping something else that it's not really not really there, then it's n then that's not working out. That doesn't that's not helping. But if it a touch if it's a touch screen pretending to be a touch screen, that's absolutely fine. If it's pretend pretending to be something that is uh, a piece of technology that that doesn't exist in the world yet, then that's fine as well. Um, as for like AR and um, VR, which is another um, another question, is like, can you have an escape room that's in virtual reality? Um, I think that it's. I think the most obvious ways to integrate them are not great, but there are probably less obvious ways. More in the, I think there's definitely potential to use augmented and mixed reality in escape rooms as long as it's not to do what we normally expect them to do, which is like we look at a screen and we see something overlaid on top through the camera. There's got to be smarter ways of using that. Um, so I, I would say it's if you wanted to do that, do it, but uh, tr uh, yeah, approach with caution and, and with a, a very big thinking hat on. It, it seems to me like part of what's going on in escape rooms is, is a return of these things that um, we're hungry for, uh, other people and physical presence and uh, a unique event that's kind of irreplaceable. And, um, and it's interesting to imagine how uh, technology and entertainment moves forward and then kind of returns to these values and it uses emerging technology to enable uh, a return of these things that were lost and that, that we're hungry for. Um, and it's, it's just a, I feel like we got a glimpse of where the future could go with, with ubiquitous technology and, and smart rooms and uh, wearable tech and AR and VR. Um, it is fascinating and amazing and Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and uh, really appreciate you giving us a glimpse. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Lovely.